Welcome to Gourmet Brewing. I am so glad you're here today. We're going to have Tobias Zolo and Scott Jennings tonight. This is, I've really been looking forward to this because we've got some, a nice contrast to our earlier live stream when we were talking to Charlie Bamsforth and Jan uh, Eakin. Almost drew a blank there. Hopefully I won't draw a blank on my name. I'm Doug Piper, host of Gourmet Brewing, and I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, and I see a lot of folks in there chatting. One of the things I'd love to know is, is the audio and video clear? Now, I'm not trying to rate how I look on screen because I know how that is, but if the audio and video is clear, just put it there in the chat, and you also might share where you're viewing this from. I see people from all over uh, I have seen Chile. I have seen, well, the Mike in Greenville, that, that's where I am. Uh, Lebanon, uh, Bellingham, Washington, Kansas, another from Chile, Michigan. Wow. This is a huge audience. If I'm looking at it, looks like we have what? 1,773 folks. So, and here's my wife. I hope giving me a check. Are we okay? Good. All right. <laughs> I need that help. I had did one last night and everything fell apart. So I'm, I'm a little paranoid about it at the moment. <laughs> all right. So now that we know all that stuff, uh, thank you for spending time with Tobias and Scott. You're at a place where we strive to make your day more delicious one sip at a time. Now, I'm pausing here because my screen is frozen, but here we go. Okay. So, um, Tobias is going to be up till past midnight tonight. So, because we can't applaud for Scott and, and for Tobias, please type in the chat how much you appreciate it and his willingness to volunteer to be online up until midnight. So, just put in the chat how much you love them and appreciate them, and let's show them you know, the kind of crowd that we are. And let me, meanwhile, let me tell you a little bit about these guys. I am going to bring them up on screen while we do. All right, Scott Jennings. He is the brewmaster at Sierra Nevada, and he's been there since 2001. He apprenticed at Young & Co's The Ram in London. He's a certified brewmaster from the VLB Berlin, and he is just one awesome brewer that I know not only likes to brew and enjoys good beer, but he also likes cycling and motorcycles. We have Tobias Zolo, the Browmaster at Weinstefaner Brewery. He apprenticed as a maltster and brewer in Bavaria. He studied brewing and beverage at Domans Academy and IHK in Munich. He's, he spent seven years as the brewmaster, and, and I'm, I'm going to try and pronounce Fel, Fel, Fel Session. <laughs> I know I did it terrible. Sorry. <laughs> and it's Switzerland. It's Leedix Brewery, and it is owned by Carlsberg. So what I want to remind a few folks on is how what all we do here. And I'm clicking around here on the screens. There we go. So if you're a first-time viewer, we do monthly free events with subject matter experts. This is the 75th free major event, thanks to supporters like Luke Pernodo, who helps me with copywriting. Whit Lanning, he provided some of today's glassware. Also some beer every now and then. <laughs> Our crowdfunders through Patreon are how we do this. And I want to give a shout out to Gordon Sherlip. And Gordon actually is not only a friend, uh, but just a great, uh, great guy overall. We'll pop him up there. So this is Gordon. And interesting thing is I just found out about Gordon. While you knew we were talking about Jim Koch and, and Crispy Fry in the last event, well, Gordon's been to Jim's home. <laughs> so that's a hard one to top. Gordon, I really appreciate your supporting Gourmet Brewing. Uh, I know you've never met a beer you didn't like, but I also know you have quite a trained palate. And I really appreciate your continued support because it's 
people like him that keep us on the air. Now, if you're interested in being part of the solution also, our Patreon supporters receive the MP3 files, behind the scenes, recent brewery tours. Uh, just join the team. You can click on the bar down there below and e explore it more. But really appreciate our Patreon supporters. Now, quick logistics. There is a follow button in the upper right-hand corner, I think roughly over there. If you will click on that, you'll always get a notification when we go live because email is unreliable. That way you'll always know it. Uh, refreshing your browser solves most technical issues. Reducing the resolution with the gear in the lower right-hand corner helps. Please share in the chat where you're from. Um, submit your questions. Now, you know, we were talking earlier to Tobias and Scott about a record, and they didn't quite beat the last record as far as registrations. But 24 questions, I think, is the most we've ever had before an event started. So <laughs> you guys are figuring out now. That's a lot of questions. And so if you don't have a question, but you see one in there you like, vote it up. And that way we will spend the most time on the most important questions. We also have a brief poll, and those guide our next events. So if you look in there at the people and the topics, that's how we prioritize them, and that's how we got to loggers and saisons before that. Also, it helps if you check auto-registration when you log on. And I do virtual speaking events and live events. Uh, so please contact me if I can help you at your corporate event. And speaking of that, I'm going to be judging in Brazil coming up next month, and I'm going to take you along, and we'll share some interesting stories about uh, Curtuba in Brazil. That's the first week in March. Now, next events, Shelly Smith of Sam Adams Brewery will be joining us. and We're going to be talking about ultra-high-gravity brewing, and we're going to open a Utopias, which is a 56-proof beer. Yes, you heard me right. 56 proof beer and we're going to hear about how that's done after that we've got julia hertz the aha director and we're going to be talking about home brewery setups and that's going to be a lot of fun there'll be a lot of videos of various folks and their breweries uh, i've already gotten one from crispy fry so we, we'll have some of that so it'll be a lot of fun peeking in everybody's brewery and what's even more fun is following this event we're going to have an after party uh, so if anybody wants to hang out, uh, I'll put the Zoom link in there now, but uh, I'll also continue to put it in there a little bit later. Uh, and I see uh, Daniel says, uh, come to Chile. <laughs> I would love to do that. All right. So I, as we're going to go through our event, I just wanted to give a quick start as to how we're going to do this. We're going to be talking about the pros and cons of decoction. We're going to open up our beers, and that has changed. I emailed everybody a little bit of a change. We'll be talking about lager yeast, uh, cellaring, maturation, and we may get to spunding again if there's time. So let's bring everybody up on screen here. Uh, man, I appreciate you guys being here, Scott and Tobias. This is awesome. So I've got a question that I want to start with. And Scott, I'm going to put you uh, on the spot here. So we had an interesting live stream with Charlie Bamsforth. Charlie took a pretty hard position on the necessity of decoction. But it seems like decoction is almost always associated with loggers, particularly fine loggers. Why is decoction always associated with loggers? Well, uh, I think we should be a little more specific, Doug. Uh, it's associated with uh, certain types of loggers, uh, most definitely. But I don't think that it's uh, necessary for every kind of logger. Uh, you know what I mean? So, uh, for example, um, on our um, um, Oktoberfest beer that we make and our uh, Summerfest beer that we make, we do not use a decoction for those brands. But on specialty beers that I'll do, um, like a Hellas or like a Pilsner, I will do one. Uh, and uh, I want to say that um, the uh, tradition of that is, is, is the reason why. So, for example, I think that there's a lot to be said for 
the flavor profile that makes a Hellas what it is or a Pilsner what it is, those flavors were defined by a practice that used to be, uh, you know, really commonplace, maybe even necessary if you go back far enough. Uh, and it helped define, uh, define what the flavor profile of those styles became. And so, in my opinion, when you want to make, um, you know, a, a really traditional uh, uh, flavor profile in a Pilsner, for example, uh, a decoction is something that uh, that you should consider. Well, Tobias, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I think we're going to have the rare mm. opportunity to kind of compare uh, one of a Weinstefaner beers that is decocted and not. So why does it seem like it's always a decoction is associated with fine lager? Yeah. This is, like Scott said, this is more um, come from tradition, and it was um, in former days, it was... Uh, especially because the malt modification was uh, very poor, so you had to um, crack the starch out of the out of the malt by mechanic. So it's when you heat it up or cook it in an extra extra mash, then you will pop up out the starch of the uh, of the malt. It's like, for example, with the when you do it with corn, so popcorn. It's more or less the same, but just in a smaller space, but you can imagine it better. Um, but when the malts uh, were getting better and better and also the, the barley and wheat um, grows, were getting better with, uh, with you know, growing malt, uh, growing barley and wheat. And so the modification was higher. So you don't have to do so much in the brewery because the malts are uh, doing a great job and do the most of the job. So that's why it's easy. Uh, the starch is easy accessible for the um, malt enzymes uh, to cut it down to the malt sugar. So that's why it's normally not so necessary to do a decoction nowadays, but it was in former days. But now, for example, it's of course it's tradition and everything. And what is tradition in Bavaria? We keep on doing because it's tradition. <laughs> um, but it's also a, a big difference. So it depends on what you want to get. So uh, for example, for our original um, premium Helles, we still use the decoction method because we want to, I think it's getting more, yeah, more edgy, uh, more, more, more rough, and, uh, more like a beer taste. So if you want to have a real beer taste, if you know what I mean. But uh, at the end, in the fermentation, or, or especially in the in the storage tank and the maturation, we want to balance this out so to have a smooth beer and, and a smooth mouth feel. But for the the new approach is, and this is getting more and more popular, especially here in uh, Germany, but everywhere I think also in the United States, it's more popular to have a very crisp, slim body, but also a smooth um, beer and with a high high drinkability. So that's why we, um, this is the first um, beer in Weinstefan we brewed with infusion method. And yeah, it's also a funny story. So we during um, development, we also had um, Professor Narcis um, as a consultant. So we <clears throat> asked him also during the development, okay, what do you think about this recipe? Do you want to try the beer? And he always said, why you don't do decoction? At least one decoction. Decoction is so important. It makes the beer balance, makes it round. It makes everything because he just knows decoction brewing. And this is uh, his point. And this is one thing I was really, really happy about because um, we caught him with the taste. So when we had the final uh, step of the recipe, um, I said, I want to try it. I just want to try it because the approach is to have a very slim body with a high drinkability and also a lighter color. Because the culture makes it darker because you cook the mesh. So we want to have a light, shiny, golden color and a high drinkability. And he tasted the beer and he agreed and said, okay, okay, maybe, maybe you're right. For this type of beer, this could be the best uh, way to brew. And this was, I think, the biggest thing I could ever reach in my brewing career if Professor Nazis agreed with, with one of my recipes. Um, Still happy with that, and uh, we have so far. It's just one year in the market. We have so far we have uh, really good um, 
success, I think, in Germany, also in the United States. So this is especially the cans, it's just available in the States. Well, that is a great story. <laughs> I love that. So while we're talking about it, so Scott, I think one of the things I would love to hear, you know, what are the pros and cons of a decoction in your mind? Uh, I mean, you guys make some lagers. Uh, I don't, you'll have to tell me whether Sierra Nevada has even an ability to decoct or not. But I know with all your experience, you've got, can you kind of weigh the pros and cons for us? Yeah. Um, equipment uh, is certainly a consideration. Um, you know, you've got to have um, a brew house, which is set up for that. Um, you know, we, I think probably correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail here as we go through on the process, you know, how, how exactly you would do it. But um, on a homebrew level, it's really quite easy. But on a large brewery level, um, you really need some specialized equipment for that. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is time. Uh, you know, it takes longer to do a decoction mashing process. Uh, it really does. You, you've got to be able to um, justify that in your schedule, depending on how busy you are. You know, uh, you, you, you could be talking, you know, the difference between an hour infusion, for example, you know, plus heat ups to three hours for a decoction process. That's expensive, uh, not only in time, but also in energy. You're going to use a heck of a lot more energy with the boiling of the mash than if you're just doing an infusion. Um, so uh, those are maybe some things to think about. But, um, you know, when I uh, would choose to do that, I really, Doug, I do that for reasons that, that are flavor related, not because the malt needs us to do it or uh, tradition needs us to do it uh, just because, but I do it for, uh, for flavor reasons. And I know a lot of people talk about with modern malts and, uh, okay, there's, there's a huge array of specialty malts available nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of opinions that you can uh, just do a, an infusion mash and then with the use of, oh, some uh, biscuit malt, melanoidin malt, uh, some things like this, you can, you can really simulate that flavor. And I would say you can get close, but it's just not the same. Uh, from a flavor point of view, it's just not the same. Now, I didn't hear you mention mouthfeel, or if you did, I missed it. Do you think there's a difference in mouthfeel between a decocted beer and one that's just achieved just through malt? Oh, I do. I really do. Uh, you know, to be a said it as well, um, it, it does make a difference. And again, that's style related to me. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get a more... Um, round full mouthfeel when you do a decoction and it's typically as well that uh, you you end up with uh, a slightly less uh, attenuation uh, with a decoction so you build a little more body into it that way as well well Tobias has a unique situation right beside him there where there is a decocted Weinstefaner beer and a non-decocted Weinstefaner beer so to be as you want to kind of tell us about the pros and cons. I know you, you, I loved your story. I think that was fantastic, but can you maybe dive into it a little bit different, a little bit deeper because you actually did tasting and those tastings revealed the profile that you preferred. Can you dive into that a little deeper? Yeah, it's like, um, I totally agree with Scott. So this is, uh, if you look just on the time or on the energy side, you won't do decoction. Of course you won't do because you have to have more um, equipment, more time, uh, energy, everything. So that's why, um, but if you want to go on the, on the taste side or on the fruit side or on the body side, you have to do decoction. If you want to have a very full body beer with a, as he said, slightly um, lower uh, atten final attenuation than in the infus infusion beers, so then you have more sugar inside, more sweetness. So typical, they are all sweeter than the standard lagers. Um, and you have it, as I said, more on the, on the rough side, if, I, if you know what I mean. But um, 
I think this is also it has some some um, point or for some beer styles. We also have a higher um, ABV in this beer. We have 5.1, and in the infusion lager we have a, a 4.8, and this sounds small different, but it is a big difference in uh, in a beer. This um, difference in uh, alcohol and also with a higher attenuation, so it makes it more slimmer, more drinkable, and everything. And the decoction beer is more a beer for. Uh, so this is I always say this is a beer for breakfast. <laughs> it's a beer for the afternoon. So it, you can have it in the afternoon with your pork knuckle or your burger or whatever you want to have. So this is then you have something in the mouth and you can feel it and have a more taste of everything. And this is yeah a very good breakfast beer or for hot sunny days when you're outside in the stadium or at the beach, then it's perfect to have a very slim lager with a lower ABV and you can drink it easier. You're so making me help. hungry. You're making yeah. me hungry, yeah. Tobias. <laughs> <laughs> and thirsty and want to travel to the beach. <laughs> yeah, that's well, the, speaking that's of the that. advantage when it's, when it's 11 p.m. So what should I do at this time? Drinking beer, so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's pour one. Uh, I have a, a Vine Stefaner original here that I will pour, and I think Scott, you have one also. I have one. Uh, Tobias, I'm going to put you on screen while I try and pour it and not make a mess here on my screen. And if you don't mind kind of describing while I'm pouring it uh, what we're all looking at and can appreciate. And then we want to see you pour the, uh, the Hellas. <clears throat> okay, I try to do that. So. I have to pour and talk and you you can drink. Okay. So I even love the sound. And as you can see, what is also a big advantage with the decoction, I think we have a better foam and a more lasting stable foam. It's a golden color, very slightly darker than a normal lager. This is also comes from the decoction when you um, cook the mash. So we also we even cook it twice. So we have two mashes. We take a, a side, cook it, and put it back to the to the whole mash. Um, that thing ends up into this uh, wonderful golden color. Um, with a nice head. This is what you get from the from the mashing. I think everything else with the what also infuses the body or the mouth feel or the, the rough taste that comes from the hops or from the spunding. If you have smaller bottles or big bottles, but now we are we are still with the mashing, right? So that's why I want to say at this point, cheers and enjoy the first sip cheers tobias delicious cheers that's good um that's really creamy really full uh mouthfeel there's a lot of that uh, multi grainy kind of character. It, sometimes you can find uh, that um, grainy is, is used um, as a, a flavor defect. Um, but I think that uh, that is not true in this case. Uh, the grainy no. is really like a bread, like a, a bread crust, even. Uh, for, for lagers, it's uh, yeah. perfect. Yeah. It, it really is. And the foam, uh, I've, I've definitely found, and it's well known, uh, a lot of research has gone into this, of course, that a decoction mash produces a better foam with all other things being equal than an infusion mash does. Um, and I've seen this even when doing a, for example, a complicated step mash where you're doing uh, uh, several rests um, uh it's it's just not quite as as um, long lasting generally um, as uh, as as you get with a decoction. 
Um, <clears throat> I totally agree. Yeah. Well, do we want to open up the Hellas? Now, Scott, you and I were unable to find one, but <clears throat> since we're comparing and talking about to decoct or to not to decoct, maybe Tobias would open that and then kind of describe the differences. Yeah. It's a can. You have to drink it from the can normally. But you can pour it as well. So, what do you find here? It's also yellow color, but it's more on the straw side. So it's lighter, it's more shinier than, than from a decoction beer. I think this is more, a little bit darker, a little more on the golden side. And this is a very shiny yellow straw one. And I think also very, very clear and, but even a nice foam. So we don't have to, so, yeah, we have a good malt, I think, and a good water. The nose is, is uh, from the nose, it's different, but this is, this is, I think, mainly from the, from the hops we use because we use different hops in the, in the two beers, um, but it's less grainy. That's true, because it's not that um, cooking of the mash. So you don't get this, this um, characters of the spent grains, what you get when you have a decoction. So that's why it's more neutral than a decoction beer. So, but that makes it um, smoother and, and easier to drink the whole day. Tobias, I see a good question in the, or comment in the chat from Martin. And do, do both beers use the same malt and grist proportions that between the Hellas and the original? Um, we use the same malt, of course. We have um, malt just from Bavaria. We have some suppliers <clears throat> uh, in the region. So very regional and, and close to the brewery. And uh, we also visit them during harvest time or growing time. Um, that's why we have the same malt, of course. But we handled it in a, in a different way. As I said, the infusion is just heating it up. And decoction, we split it, we cook it, we split it, we cook it again. So that makes it more, we, we really cook out the, the, like Scott said, the grainy things or the hard things from the, from the spent grains. And the grist, grist is um, um, lower. So here we have more water. As I said, we have a lower ABV, um, so it's but it's not a big difference. Of course not. Well, great. As we then kind of wrap up our discussion before we move on to the next topic, uh, how would you summarize, Tobias, if, if just a sentence or two or three, when you would choose to decoct and maybe when you would choose not to decoct? Yeah, if you want to have a very crisp, easy drinkable, slim body um, beer uh, for the whole day, then you have to take the infusion. And if you want to have more body, more mouthfeel, more edgy, more, more beer than lager, then you have to use decoction. And I think you will have a big benefit on that. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, just off the top of my head, Doug, um, um, once again, I'd, I'd choose it for flavor reasons. Um, in terms of uh, mouthfeel and body, um, this is something that I found uh, is uh, with an infusion mash, when you want to have um, um, more body in the beer, less attenuation, you, you can just simply use a higher mashing temperature. Uh, and achieve the same result and but you would think so okay uh, but uh, maybe there are still some differences um, I've made uh, uh, beers where uh, I've done a an infusion mash on the one with the temperature so that the the final beer numbers will be the same as doing uh, a decoction mash on the other so let's say for 
descent uh, for, for for argument's sake that you have two beers. Maybe it's a Hellas. One is um, uh, they're, they're both finishing at uh, 1.5 Play-Doh. I don't know, 1.6. Pick a number. Uh, the decoction one will feel like it has more body than the other one. And it's not simply attenuation rate because you can control that with an infusion mesh. It has also to do with uh, roundness and fullness. Uh, there's a lot more melanoidins uh, in a decoction uh, mash wart, and this also impacts mouthfeel as well. So um, it's a little more complicated than just looking at the numbers. You have to look at the sensory impressions as well. Yeah, that's that's the point because there are so many influences there. Because when you split the mash and pump it to a, another vessel, you have um, oxidization because you will get some air inside and oxidization of the fatty acids, for example. Um, when you do it, do it twice like we do, you have even more. You cook it, you have uh, you pump it again back, so you have more more handling, more mechanics, more oxygen, more everything, and you will that will end up in a different taste, in a more harder taste, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So that's like Scott said. It's the, the big difference is not on not on the analysis. The big difference is on just on the taste, or what means just. It's it is on the taste. So that depends on what you want to have. So if you want to have a very bright beer or a, a full beer decoction, if you want to have a high drinkable, easy drinking beer infusion. All right. Unless there was another word, we're going to move on to the yeast, if we can. And to be as I kind of thought we would start with you, since so many of the lager yeast that we all know and love <laughs> originated with your brewery. So the question is really, and in our last discussion that we had with uh, Charlie and, and Jan, there was some debate about the necessity of a lager yeast in a lager, because of course the word lager just means to store, doesn't necessarily preclude uh, a lager yeast or not. Mm -hmm. So from your point of view, can, can you talk about the yeasts and yeast handling and the importance or the lack thereof uh, with using a true lager yeast? what you said so uh, i think uh, a lot of people focus on, on on mashing if they can but a lot of can't because they don't have the equipment um that's why the, the most people focus on hops because hops it's it's easy to exchange the hop or it's easy to uh, just buy a different hop style and add it it's not that easy as it sounds scott knows <laughs> knows it best but it's it's easier than everything else for example yeast so if you're a home brewer, you, you get some yeah, liquid yeast or, or dry yeast. Um, but yeast, I think yeast is, uh, for me, the biggest in, in influence on the, on the beer taste of everything else. So you can, this, yeah, we can make everything wrong or everything right. That's why we have a, a, a big view on our yeast management. And yeast management means for us that we have one yeast strain and it's um, just a little correction. Uh, it's not related to our brewery because they always so mostly called Wine Stefan 3470, for example, to name a common one. But that comes not from the brewery, it comes from the university. It's at the next, just the next door, or it's even in the same building than the brewery. And this is. Um, for us, it's a big advantage because they're in the yeast center, they store the yeast and they have all varieties and they have all the knowledge about that. And we can easily um, exchange uh, knowledge or they try something in the brewery or we go over and ask something. So that's a big benefit for us. Um, also have the, the quality control here side by side. Um, but the, the name is from the university, the yeast and not from the brewery. Um, so, for example, we have the 3470. This is the, the common one for the lager beers. And we have a yeast propagator, two yeast propagator in our brewery, uh, one yeast 
pitching tank and two yeast cropping tanks. Um, so we have to, or we try to exchange the yeast or take new cells from the university every three months and then start from the very beginning. So from a small Karlsberg Holden to a, a bigger vessel and then just propagate it very properly. We control it, we measure the viability, we measure the yeast cells, we measure the, the dead cells. And when it's enough for us from experience, when we know this is the best taste for us, then we pitch the yeast and then we crop it. We crop it normally eight to 10 times, depends on the, on the brewing schedule or in the season, of course, but not longer. I think it's, uh, it takes some generations to have the, the best um, power of the yeast. So maybe a generation five, then it's adopted to the word and it has more power and it's faster in, in fermentation, but still with good results. But when it comes to generation 10, this goes down. That cell's going up. You need more yeast to have the same uh, fermentation speed and fermentation result. So that's why we control that every every time, every week, we measure our yeast and uh, control that because this is key. This is the, the best and important um, worker in the brewery is the yeast. So they're living cells and we handle them with care because that is key. I know it's not so easy if you have uh, just uh, the um, option to take dry yeast if you're a home brewer, but then I can, as I said, it's the adoption is very important. So one of the most um, common things uh, home brewers are doing, they put uh, the dry yeast directly into the fermenter from the, from the bag into the fermenter because this is the instruction. But I would suggest to take something from the from the mash or something from the first word. Okay, it's higher in in uh, in, uh, in sugar, but you can dilute it with um, with water, and then put the yeast inside at the temperature when you want to pitch the yeast. So the yeast is jumping into this sugar. It's getting a little bit adopted to the word knows the sugar, says hello, <laughs> and everything else. And then you can you can uh, pitch a liquid yeast, which is a little bit more not so shocked if it's going into the, the cold word with hops, because hops is always not so good for, for yeast. And that's why I would suggest that. And we are doing that more or less um, with our yeast in the propagator. Just give fresh word at the temperature we want to pitch it, let it adapt to the to the word to the sugar. They should know each other. It's in every brewery. It's a little bit different the content of the sugars and everything else. And that's why when the yeast is feeling good, then the yeast will do good work. And it's also a point of um, temperature. It's a point of pressure. It's a point of oxygen when you will give to the to the yeast propagation. And this is a big, big science. And I think it's still not finished to uh, deep uh, dive deeper into this um, thing. Well, just to simplify the question, besides your Hepaweizen, mm -hmm. do you brew at your brewery, at Vine Stefaner, anything that doesn't use lager yeast besides the Hepaweizen? We have two yeasts, yeah. We have a Hefeweizen yeast and a lager yeast for our lager beers. And they are different. They are different in uh, pH, optima, optimum temperature, optimum, and also they are producing different um, side products. So what we want in, uh, in the Hefeweizen, for example, Easter, and all these banana, fruity things, isomil, acetate, and everything else. We want it in the Hefeweiss, but we don't want it in the lager. And you can do a lot of things wrong in the lager or with the lager yeast. And you also have this side products you don't want to have typically in a lager. But this is also a point of equipment because a lot of people don't have 
this equipment or, or a lot of breweries. That's why, yeah, we have it. That's, that's the point when we come to spunding, for example, or to tank size or, or tank vertical or horizontal tanks. Um, this is also a big influence on the, on the yeast and all the side products they are producing. Well, Scott, Charlie uh, Bamsforth told the story that he toured a brewery and it had loggers and he asked him what the yeast was that they used. And they said they just used their house yeast. So, <laughs> and apparently their house yeast was not a lager yeast. Hmm. So kind of what's, what's the other side of the coin? Can you, can you brew a good lager without a, a lager yeast? And, and I would love to open up this Augustiner when you're ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 a great question, and um, I, I I think it, there's it's always going to be something people will debate. Um, my my own personal opinion is that uh, uh, you know if you say can you make a good lager with ale yeast? Well, what do we what do we mean when you say good? <laughs> you know, uh, let's let's maybe start there, but. Uh, uh, I think there are some really fundamental differences in the the two two yeast types. Uh, Tobias was talking about um, uh, flavor um, and aroma uh, compounds that the yeast will produce. Um, our uh, house ale yeast, for example, um, I've certainly found a lower limit of fermentation temperature that it uh, it is happy with. Um, and, you know, below that, and, and this is well above, you know, typical lager fermentation temperatures. Um, below that, you just get a lot of uh, sulfurs, mostly H2S, and it's very unpleasant. Um, but when you are uh, in the yeast happy, uh, you know, range, you get a lot of esters, uh, a whole lot, uh, and it's really quite fruity. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not necessarily in the flavor profile of Hellas to be, uh, you know, full of fruity esters. You know, uh, can you do it? Yeah, you can do it. Um, but, um, you know, we have to give a little bit of a, a nod to uh, style guideline a little bit and, and flavor profile. Uh, do you know what I mean? You, you won't win a World Beer Cup that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, pro probably not. Um, but you know, uh, that said, you can you can do some really interesting things with with any yeast strain. Uh, Tobias, you were talking about uh, the influence of pressure or uh, the influence of temperature. Um, you know, you can find the range at which um, any given strain will be able to ferment in a in a healthy way. Um, beyond the, the high and the low of that range, you're going to find that the yeast gets really stressed and it does things that you, you really won't be happy with. Uh, you'll end up with uh, a lot of off flavors. Uh, most of them are, are not positive. Uh, and the same thing can be said with uh, applying a lot of pressure too early in the, in the fermentation. Uh, that, can be, that can be a problem as well. Uh, for example, um, uh, in, in Hefeweizen with the open fermenters, it's pretty typical that the depth of the liquid in these tanks is not uh, greater than the width of the tank, kind of a one-to-one. -one. And uh, that is because you really want the, the yeast to, to be able to uh, do the primary fermentation in the absence of any excess pressure. And on the other hand, uh, other strains, um, you can suppress certain off flavor formation by applying a little bit of pressure. And so it, it really, uh, to echo Tobias, what you said, the yeast makes the beer. We don't make beer. The yeast makes the beer. And you have to do everything you can to find out what you, uh, what you have to do with any given strain of yeast to get the result that, that you're looking for and keep the yeast healthy. That's yeah. the, the main thing. And how to treat the yeast because it's, um, yeah, you can use the same strain in different breweries and have different results, of course. 
So that's why we found our way of yeast management or yeast handling to have the taste we want to have also for different uh, styles of beers. And yeah, one, one big point, for example, is the pressure. So I'm, I think as Scott said, what is good and what is not good and do, is it award winning or not? As Doug said, um, for me, the first point is not to uh, win an award. It's, it's nice. Yeah, of course, it's nice to win an award because somebody appreciates that. But I think um, my, my key or uh, the key in mind, Stefan, is we want to have a, a, a balanced beer. We, this is the, the main key. Is it, is it on the rough side or on the very slim side or smooth side? But it has to be balanced in total. It has to be inside of the, the, the style category and the tradition of the Bavarian breweries because this is what the customer expects. They, when they open up uh, when Stefan Helles, they expect something. They expect something else than expect from a, a home brewer from the United States. It's not, I don't want to say this is better or this is worse. This is a different taste and, and different from what you expect. That's why we have to focus on this is what our way of brewing that we've been inside the style category representing the Bavarian, Bavarian tradition and have a very balanced, high drinkable beer in all the different types. And that's why for us, diacetyl esters are not good in lagers. They're perfect. Um, diacetyl is nowhere perfect. So there are beer styles that the people um, accept it or like it, but it's not in a Bavarian lager and it's not in a Bavarian wheat. And as Scott said, the, the esters, uh, for example, if you do it in the wheat beers, we have a... Um, uh, a horizontal tank that is very, very low. So we have uh, no pressure at all, on, not on the liquid side and not on the tank side. Then when you have no pressure, you get a lot of Easters. Also with the special yeast we have. And in the for the bottom fermenting, for the lager beers, we use the vertical tanks, very high, 50 meters, 18 meters high. And we even set a little bit pressure on it. So not pressure, it's spunding, but we, um, because the higher the pressure, the lower the, the Easter potential or Easter production. And, but as Scott said, <laughs> um, the point is when to start spunding. So we have, uh, of course, we have pressure from the liquid side, but we don't want to give extra pressure with just for spunding. So that's why we start very late in fermentation process. So when more or less when the, the diacetyl is on the high peak, then we start spooning because this is also typically the, when the extract is one or two percent above the final extract. And then it's the, the best point to start spooning and it's the best point to setting pressure on it to reduce also the Easters or not um letting grow more easters mm -hmm. yeah good point tobias um but, uh, typically uh here in the us we we use um uh bunging as the uh, equivalent term for spunding meaning you have uh closed the the vent valve down so that the tank can build pressure by the yeast but um once you uh the the tank top the head pressure reaches the level that you have set the valve for it will bleed off the excess pressure beyond that set point uh and we're doing the same thing uh on ales as well as lagers uh by the way tobias you know this you've been here before but uh yeah. we uh we we bung the tank um you can make a calculation it's not that hard to do so yeah. if you know what your final gravity is going to be on your beer. And you know this because you've done a forced uh, accelerated fermentation on that beer in the lab. And so you have a number. Then you can say, well, at what gravity before terminal can I bung the tank? And to what pressure should I bung that tank to? So that uh, at the end of fermentation, I have reached my target carbonation level, uh, whatever that is. And that's an easy calculation. Um, and uh, we, t we try and do that at the last possible second because uh, that way uh, you have less chance for off flavors because you've put a stress on the yeast. 
Yeah, that's right. As I said, it's a living living culture. It's the important uh, worker in the in the brewery, and yeast makes the beer. So no pressure on the yeast because we also don't like a big pressure. So we work different when we have pressure. So it's the same with the yeast. So let the yeast chill in the tank, adapt it to the world, handle it with care. Then it will get the, the best results, in my opinion. Mine's about empty. Let's open another one. Scott, you going to talk about the Augustiner? Uh, sure. Um, we have the Edelstoff. Um, Tobias, I, I think they make this mostly for export. Is that right? <clears throat> um, as far as I know, so I know they have it also in, in Bavaria, but it's not the, the common one. They have the normal, that's what, what I have, for example. It's the normal lager beer. Um, this is the common one, but they have the edel stuff also here in, in Germany, and they don't have that big export at all, as far as I know, because they don't push it. Mm. They focus on the German market. But in export, you will, I think you will just find the, the edel stuff. But you know, can you remember last visit last year? You've been here, yeah, when sure. You at the, the, the craft brewery with, with my friend Marcus. And after that, we went back to Munich, and then it, of course, it was a great idea. Great idea after drinking the whole day beers. It was, of course, a great idea to go into the Augustina Breustübel, to the Augustina Keller, and sitting in the beer garden. And as it is typical in Bavaria, uh, in the evening you just get uh, the big glasses, so the the max, the one liter max. And yeah, we had the Edelstoff. From the yeah. from the wooden barrel, right, <laughs> right, yeah, that's right. Not just one, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, but that's a good point. Uh, we sh we should talk, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We should talk about that a little bit. Drinkability. Uh, that that's a, a kind of a great topic uh, to kind of go into. But I mean, you can see the beer once again. A beautiful foam, brilliantly clear, um, just pale golden. And there's a floral note uh, from the hops. Uh, and you just get that nice malty, bready, grainy character um, that, uh, that I just love about, uh, I love about it. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it is so, so eminently drinkable. Um, maybe we should move into uh maturation a little bit and talk about that um i think augustiner is famous for really kind of sticking to their guns on um a, a fairly long maturation time um i don't know what they do uh you know i i can't even guess but um uh there's a, there's an old uh tradition um which is talking about lagering uh, for one week for every uh, degree Plato original gravity, which is probably uh, extremely excessive. And if you think back historically, that temperature uh, would have been not, uh, you know, at, you know, minus one degrees or something like we do today. Uh, you know, uh, that was uh, stored in, in the cellar, maybe ice cooled cellars and um, underground. So uh, it might have been there for uh, a long time at, say, I don't know, 40 degrees. Uh, if I have my little conversion table here, sorry, I have to refer to it periodically, but it might have been at four degrees or something for much of that long time. But uh, at any rate, uh, I think uh, maturation is, is pretty key to drinkability. Uh, I'd be interested, uh, Tobias, and what do you say about that? Because one thing that I've found is that when you drink a beer like that, you can drink it uh, by the leader, uh, and repeat. And, uh, it's, it's never getting, uh, too cloying. It's, it's, it's always, uh, you know, eminently drinkable. And even the next day, uh, I can tell you, I feel a lot better if I drink four liters of, uh, of your beer, Tobias, than if I drink four liters of, of torpedo <laughs> for example <laughs> uh yeah. it, it's just a little bit of a different experience 
Yeah, but this is also, uh, I think, uh, one main reason is the, the ABV. And if you have a higher one, like in the Torpedo or in the, also in the Edelstoff, you can, we had two liter marks and then we were happy to find, found the way to bed. Um, that's why it's for every occasion. Uh, for every time is the, or every occasion is the best beer. So it's the best beer, the Edelstoff, when you sit in the beer garden at the evening or the original. Um, but as for breakfast, for example, or when it's, when it's hot outside, then you need a crisp lager. Or a torpedo is also more uh, evening beer. Right. That's, that's, that's the point. So that's why it's not, you can't say it's a good beer or a bad beer. No, it's at which time you want to drink it or with which food or which, yeah. Right. People. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I get that. Well, I guess the point I was trying to make is um, that uh, you have in, in the maturation process, you have um, the esterification of higher alcohols. Mm -hmm. uh, and the higher alcohols are, uh, the absence of those, I think really play a big part in, in drinkability and repeatability. Uh, and, uh, you, you, you can, uh, you, you always have higher alcohols when you have higher gravity beers, of course, yeah. but you also get that with warmer fermentations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, the, the, the long maturation time allows those, compounds to um the the concentration goes down um over time as the beer is stored in the cellar uh, i suppose nowadays that's more uh, applicable to bach beers uh than it is to a hellas um yes of course because you have a higher gravity and i totally agree with the higher temperature higher temperature makes also more side products more um, esters, diacetyl, everything else. But in a in a bock beer, you want to have more of everything, and it's okay to have more of everything. Also, add more hops, for example, and you have a lower final attenuation, so it's also sweeter normally. Um, but that's everything you don't want to have in a in a crisp, clean lager beer. So that's also that's why I said. Um, yeast management or temperature management pressure management that's that's also key where you can um with that things you can um adjust your beer in the cellar the, there is where you make your beer more than in the brew house i think mm -hmm. yeah i agree so scott you're you are more familiar with augustiner than i am uh and and looking at the the beers side by side, and I have the the uh, the Vine Stefaner is is here, and the Augustiner is there, and as you as you can tell, that the colors are almost identical. The Augustiner might be slightly lighter, uh, and you know the profile is was for me uh, shockingly different. Can, I know we don't know the details, but can you describe the differences? Because it's a pretty big difference between the Vine Stefaner original and the Augustiner. Yeah, I agree, Doug. Um, you know, that said, you're, you're going to find differences between any two beers. Uh, but these are definitely different. I'm getting, I think the, uh, the Augustiner is sweeter. There's a little bit more of that, um, eh, a little more honey, um, maybe character in there. Um, and, you know, a lot of this too might be driven, Doug, by uh, the age of these uh, beers. I, mean, I really couldn't say how old the, any of these are, but I'm not saying that I'm getting a lot of age character. But, uh, um, yeah, they're, they're different. The hop character is different. The, the body is different. I think the, the color and the, the foam are, are pretty similar. But, um, you know, I really can't say what malts uh, or hops they're using. They're famously secretive, um, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean, it just goes to show you that you can find a lot of variation in a style like that. A lot of people say, well, 
you know, um, a Hellas, there's really not much to it. It's, yeah, you know, not as hoppy as a Pilsner, not as, not as bitter maybe. Um, but, um, and, uh, then a Hellas, but, uh, if you take any two, uh, Hellas, uh, or heck, you know, treat yourself, go get a whole, uh, flight of them and you will find a lot of differences, a lot of differences. And most of those might be in the finish and in the, in the malt, uh, character and in the sweetness and body. That's where the differences are going to be, I think. Well, Is I thought it was just right? really interesting that they were so, so different. Uh, so as we begin to, you know, wrap up, uh, Tobias, I, I think maybe with, with your expertise in lagering, uh, can you just kind of summarize cellularing and maturation and, and, you know, the important aspects of it? Yeah, yeast management and temperature. So I also have to calculate it. Um, sorry for that. In Celsius, we have 10 degrees maximum for, for main fermentation. So that's 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and for the main fermentation, or normally we started with nine and let it rise to 10. Um, and also the yeast management, of course, yeast handling. So have the high viability and uh, less uh, dead cells and let the let the yeast have time to adapt to the to the word you use um and then you will get the best results and the pressure is pressure is key i think so more pressure less yeaster to say it easy well that kind of covers our spending spending question i think also <laughs> <laughs> well we are up to 41 questions uh, so at, at this point, <clears throat> it's extremely important for those of you in, in the audience to kind of vote up. Everybody gets one vote. And if you can kind of skim the questions and see which one you want voted up, we'll get to those first and spend the most time there. Uh, I had promised you guys a brief break. If anybody wants a brief, brief break and, uh, what, what I'll talk about, just remind everybody uh, that these are all supported by our uh, Patreon support supporters. That's how we stay on the air. So uh, if you want to keep us on the air and keep getting great guests and things like that, I would encourage you to explore how you might support our programs. So do we want to move on to the questions or uh, you guys want to catch your breath? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go, Doug. Well, I'll do my best. Okay. All right. <laughs> no All right. 41 questions. Uh, so we'll take our time with the first couple of questions, and then we'll have to kind of uh, do it rapid fire after the first few. So we'll see what our most important questions are, most highly voted. Wow. <laughs> Timothy has 15 votes on his. Uh so what process does your brewery use to mitigate oxygen content in your strike water and in the mash? So who would like to jump with that one first? Uh, yeah, I'll start. Um, yeah, uh, the topic of um, hot side oxidation is, is um, one that always comes up. Um, I think it's a good topic. I think it does make a difference. Uh, you have... Uh, I think the, 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 the one and only time where you really want to introduce oxygen or air into your stream is aerating cold wort before you're putting the yeast in there. That is the one and only time. Every other time you should try to, to keep it away. Uh, with the, in the brew house, we are de-aerating uh, our water. We've got a... Um, a uh, that's a it's a membrane uh, type system which um, can uh, exchange oxygen for nitrogen in the water in the liquid water and so we're removing the oxygen from the water for mashing in um, this is uh, I guess important uh, in our case we're, we're using a, um, a wet mill or a, a hydrating mill but in this mill 
you're adding the mesh water at the same time as you're crushing your malt. And there's a lot of turbulence. There's a lot of agitation going on. And when the presence of oxygen, you're going to have really a lot of uh, exchange between your, your malt and your wort and the oxygen in an environment like that. So we take, take it out of the water. Uh, and then the mill, we can also purge the gas space uh, with nitrogen during that process. Um, other than that, I think the classic rules apply where if you can, when you're transferring uh, into your mash, for example, or from your mash into your louder, um, and if that is the one and the same, um, you know, then of course you don't have the problem. But um, transfer uh, from the bottom of the one vessel into the bottom of the other vessel. You want to avoid splashing. Splashing is not, not good. Uh, try to avoid that. And in the, in, in the loudering with sparging, uh, the classic rule there is you, you can maintain uh, over the top of your grain bed a very thin liquid surface, a film of water. Uh, as that sparge water is spraying down, the sparge water is hot, by the way. And hot uh, water has a less, uh, oxygen is less soluble the hotter the water is. So in the water, it's maybe not that bad. But if you're spraying it on a dry grain bed in your louder tone, you're going to be putting a lot of oxygen into your, into your, uh, into your wort. Um, Tobias, what do you think? What do you guys do? Yes, the same. Absolutely right. Um, as you said, hot water has less uh, potential to to oxidize, so that's why it's not a big deal with the sparging water, but it's a big deal with the spent grains if they are not protected by a water film or a word film. So that's why what I said before with the decoction system, what what is oxidization? Where, where is it? And um, fatty acids, for example, when they have no water around, when they when you let jump it into the to the mesh tun, for example. So that's not good. But um, everything else in the brewers, I think it's uh, less potential to oxidize something because it's hot water. But the colder it gets, the more important it, it is. And I would say it even, even harder than Scott, the only thing who needs uh, uh, oxygen in the brewery is, is, uh, is the word he said. And I think the only thing is uh, yeast. You have to ox um, to ox uh, put some oxygen into the word, of course, but the word, the cold word, also doesn't like uh, um, oxygen. So beer and oxygen are big enemies; they don't like each other. Um, that's why <clears throat> protect everything. We have a, um, a deaeration system for our pro processing water, for example, for our brewing water and for our processing water. Um, so we do it more or less. It's a, it's like a stripping method. So we put some CO two into the to the brew water, and strip all the oxygen out to have a um, a water with less than one ppm or zero point five ppm oxygen. Because then we have uh, water we can flash the pipes, for example, from fermentation tank to storage tank, from storage tank to filtration, from filtration to BBT to fill, uh, to filling line. We flash every line with deaerated water just to be sure to have as less as possible oxygen in, in the whole process. Because if you, for example, have a um, don't do that or you don't um, carbonize, uh, pressurize your, your tank um, before filling it up after fermentation. So we have a two tank system. Um, when we go from the fermentation tank to the storage tank, maturation tank, we have to prepare the tank before with the CO2. So that's why we normally just clean it with, um, with acid. So then we can do it under CO2 atmosphere. Uh, with caustic, it's completely destroyed. That's why um, a maturation tank you can clean with, a, with um, acid. And then you have still the CO2 inside. And after that, you will flash it again with CO2. We measure the, the oxygen content on the, on the tank outlet or on the, on the highest point because CO2 will let it in from the bottom because it's heavier than oxygen. Then we push out the oxygen because when you 
oxidize your beer in the lager tank, for example, then you, you will not find any oxygen content in the finished beer, but you will find a very bad taste because it's already oxidized in the, in the lager tank. So that's why it's absolutely key to look on the oxygen in the whole process, not only on the water, which you use for brewing. It's even worse in the, in the cold part of the brewery. Wow. <laughs> I had no idea the extent you went to, to use, to deoxygenate nearly everything except mm. the wart. That's phenomenal. Okay. <laughs> well, with Scott having stepped away for a moment, uh, you get the last word. Oh, there he is. I'm back. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, my browser crashed. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, did you want a last word on that, Scott, or we want to move to the next question? Uh, let's move along. Okay. Uh, Timothy, uh, congratulations on having the most popular question. Uh, Franco is second to him. And what is the ideal water profile for most clear loggers? For example, Pilsner or a Hellas? Who wants that one? Yeah. Um, we uh, use a very smooth or how do you say? By the way, I have to exclude from my bad English. Um, we have to use a very soft water. That's the word, I think. Um, so we have a very hard water in Bavaria. That's why it was typical 100 years before when you cannot, when you were not able to treat the water. Um, we had very dark beers in this region. And that's, the, for example, in the region in the Czech Republic, they had very soft water. That's why they, they put the same recipe from Munich to Pilsen, for example, and they had a very light and shiny beer. And they said, wow, why is it I have the same recipe? Because uh, the water has a big, big influence on the, on the beer style or in the beer color. And that makes everything, also the mouthfeel and the taste and, and so on. And that's why we treat our water, because we also want to have not only dark beers, we want to have um, crisp uh, lagers and or pilsners. That's why we treat it. We have, um, I don't know which uh, thing you calculate. We have it in, uh, in degrees of, um, Scott, maybe you can help me. What was? Yeah, what did, what did the degrees, uh, DH. Uh, DH, uh, okay. This is okay. This is... Yeah, it's hardness. It's German, hardness. German yeah. hardness. More, more or less bad, yeah. um, bad translation. Okay, DH, that's cool. Um, we have here, it goes up to 25 or 30 in some regions, and that's not good for, for um, lager beers. So that's why we treat them. Um, we get out mostly all or sometimes everything of the hardness or the the big hard building things like calcium and magnesium, we, we put it, remove it completely. And then we, we add again, um, what we want, calcium chloride, or a little bit magnesium sulfate, just, uh, this is the, the best thing to have a, a good beer. And then we have, we end up in DH with three to five, depends on the beer type, but this is the range. We deaerated, we heat it up, and then we use it for for mashing and for everything else. And then I think we with this um, DH you get the best um, results for um, for this style category. Is it the same for Pilsners and for your Hellas water profile? Um, if you want to do a Pilsner, you will as as less or as soft as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Good, good points, Tobias. Um, yeah, hardness. Um, you've got, um, I don't know. Classically, they they say temporary hardness or permanent hardness. Um, residual alkalinity is, um, I believe, the permanent hardness, and this is uh, to be avoided. You can look at your municipal water reports and and see this information anywhere you live. That's uh, free information, but um, uh, the the High residual alkalinity 
what that tends to do in the brew house is it's trying to it's it's making your ph go up uh, and this this is not good so um if you can remove this by uh, treatment then you have a much better chance of controlling your ph is through the brew house uh, particularly in sparging mm -hmm. for example that ph will start to go up more and more um, and once you get above I don't know, Tobias, what you would say, but I would say uh, if you have um, uh, a ward pH at the end of your loud ring, more than 5.8, you probably have, have some problems. I would even say our target is 5.5 five or, or, or the maximum. Our target is 5.3, so we have a little bit sour, mm. sour good. So um, in the... In the Word and uh, not in the word. No, no, it's in the word. Yeah, end of boiling. We add a little bit sour good for the for the lagers because you want to have a very low pH, lowest five three five five. Mm -hmm. Then you will get the best results. Um, yeah. We Scott, I don't want good. to go down a rabbit hole, <clears throat> but I know Chico's water is quite a bit different than Mills River water in North Carolina. It what, is, what lessons yeah. have you learned? <laughs> juggling those water profiles between the two facilities uh, well, unless we that's have a to, rabbit hole no not really i mean i think i can touch on it real quickly um you know the uh mash ph wart ph um are um, critical control points for us so um, mash phs for pale beers um, i like to see in the mash ton maybe 5.3 5.4 um, and your water is going to have a lot to do with that. Um, and uh, during the course of your runoff, uh, you will start out more or less at the same pH as your mash was, but then as you're sparging, that will tend to change a little bit, depending, again, on, on how much sparge water and what the uh, chemistry of the water is. Um, but long story short, Doug, uh, the, the Chigo water has a very high mineral content, um, and a lot of alkalinity and we have to uh, we have to treat that and we're doing that um, by uh, acidifying the water as it's coming in and what that does is that causes uh, a lot of precipitation reactions and so a lot of the the, the calcium precipitates out uh, when you lower the pH um, but here in Mills River it's quite the opposite uh, we have very soft water there's very, very little alkalinity, very little mineral content um, to speak of. And in that case, we have it easy because uh, what we can do here is we can build the water up using uh, calcium sulfate, calcium chloride, and maybe some magnesium on occasion. We can build it up to the profile that we want for any beer style that we're making. Uh, but it's a lot easier to do that than it is to try and take that stuff out of the water. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> That's right, yeah. We have to take it out and then to add the, the right thing, as I said, calcium chloride, or uh, as I said before, because um, we have a lot of benefits with that. So chlorides are good for the, um, for the enzymes, from the mold enzymes, alpha amylases, for example, they love the, the chloride. Um, calcium is good for collecting the, the oxalates. This is... Um, one reason for gushing so if you have calcium and chloride that's that's good for you at the whole beer process <laughs> brewing process um yeah yeah years ago um in chico i see somebody was asking about ro water years ago this is quite a while ago now we did ro treat all of our brewing liquor uh and uh, really kind of um, take everything out of it but uh uh, and then, then it was a lot easier to, to build it up again um, to the profile that you want. But the problem with that is that RO water, um, oh, it's quite expensive to make. Uh, it takes a lot of energy, and you have uh, a wastewater stream associated with that too. So after a certain t point in time, that didn't make sense to do anymore. Well, that was an awesome question. Uh, I love that one. And the next one, you guys are going to have to help me with the pronunciation. Uh, Fernando uh, has, and I'll, I'll embarrass myself and give it a shot. Is it a common practice for German breweries to brew a Helles with Sauergut? Am I pronouncing right? S-A-U-E-R-G-U-T? 
Uh, for me, it's correct, yeah. And I think I can speak German sometimes. <laughs> Not really. How, how close Bavarian. did that come? We, we speak Bavarian. Yeah. Um, Sauerkraut, yeah, of course. We, we use that. We, we use it especially for the, for the lager beers. Um, we use it because we want to have an even lower pH because that's better for our, our lager yeast, for our yeast management. And also for the, the stability of the whole beer, if you, you have a drop of the pH in the fermentation, of course, and with a lower pH, with around about 4.2, then you have a longer stability and a, and a better taste. The higher it is, it is, I don't know if it's right, but for me, it's a sweeter taste. So that's why um, I want to have a, a lower pH. And we added, if this is the next question, sour good, we ended at the end of boiling and not in mashing, because in mashing, we have no problems with our decoction system, also not with the infusion with the high modified malt. Um, why we um, added at the end of boiling? Because um, lower pH is good for the tasteability, but higher pH is better the, uh, for hop alpha acid dilution in the word. So we want to have the chance to um, get as much as possible of the alpha acids uh, in liquid and during boiling. And at the end of the boiling, we sour it down to the pH we want, 5.3, 5.5, better 5.3, then start fermentation and go down uh, to 4.2 and have the, the beer taste we want. Mm -hmm. Scott, I'm guessing that's a process not used at Sierra Nevada. Well, believe it or not, we do have a system for that. Um, so sour wort is, is something that we uh, we produce as well. Um, and just uh, for the um, audience here, um, the general process is you would make a special brew, uh, and then this wort goes to your sour wort plant, uh, which is essentially you know a, a fermentation tank, and there you're inoculating that with uh, lactobacillus. And there's a lot of strains. There's many options there. Each one has a different performance characteristic and also even flavor. Uh, but in the end, um, you're producing a sour wort. And that wort, uh, Tobias, if, if I'm remembering correctly, that uh, is used for pH adjustment in the brew house, which is something to do with the Reinheitsgebot, uh, because this is a traditional brewing practice and it's allowed uh, completely. It's, it's a, a normal way to adjust pH in the brew house? Uh, it is allowed if you use um, special bacteriums, bacterias which are growing naturally on the, on the mold. Mm -hmm. You can use them and there are some one of them are the best ones. You can also buy them from the Weinstefan University and then you can start it up. It's more or less the same like a yeast treatment if you want to compare it. Um, different temperature, it's around about 40 degrees Celsius um, with this bacterium naturally from the barley, from the field, and then you use the, the, the neutral things. We are not allowed to use in the Reynolds keyboard and the purity law some lactic acid, which is common outside of Germany, but we have to prepare it on our own, like a propagation of a sour good. Mm -hmm. And so we have to bring some wort inside, have it on the, on the best uh, temperature level. We have to take samples. We have to measure it. Where's the pH? Where's the, the all the other things we have to control inside that? And also the microbiologically, um, because it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, not so easy to treat than just have a lactic acid from a chemical supplier. Right. Yeah, and, and the flavor is going to be completely different too. Um, we we have this plant, uh, but um, Doug, to answer your question, we we don't use it to modify the pH in the brew house for the reasons we've been talking about. We use it uh, for uh, the purposes of, I guess you could call it kettle souring for a couple of beers that we make. Uh, one is a wild little thing, which uh, is a you know slightly tart um, kettle soured beer. And then, um, of course, prior to that, the Otra Vez, uh, which was more of a Goza type, uh, we used the, the same process for. So that's almost like Guinness with uh, adding the uh, soured uh, beer 
a little bit to uh, to theirs. I suppose, yeah, I suppose so. Similar. Okay. Well, you you beat me to it because I was going to ask that question. All right, we're getting close to the top of the hour, which means we have thirty minutes less. And we've got one question with ten, and then after this, we're going to have to kind of do it rapid fire. So Ricardo asks the question. How do you tease out the optimal fermentation temperature for a given lager yeast strain? Benefits of cold fermentation. Problems when you ferment as fast as possible with lager yeast at 15 degrees C or more. So question is, how do you tease out optimal fermentation temperatures for a particular yeast? That's like I said, so we have the yeast management and we found the best way to produce um, the beer test we want and to handle the yeast as uh, as it should be handled. And yeah, easy to say the higher the temperature, the higher the pressure, the higher the, uh, uh, the, higher the temperature, more easters, lower pressure, more easters. So that's why we, we don't want to have a high temperature and it's when it's too fast, so it's the same like the pressure. Let it time. So give yeast the time. It's a living culture. It needs time. It's not a, a screw you can yeah adjust. It's just a living culture. So let them work. They do a good, great job if you treat them well. Um, high temperature, so you get very fast beer and you can push a lot into the market and it's okay for some people's, but it's not the approach we have. We want to have the balanced beers with the taste we have with the with our our style category. And it's as I said, this balance is key. So when I have it more roughly in the in the brew house, I want to balance it out, and I want to have maximum ten degrees. Then wait until the diacetyl is down, um, taste it, then uh, spoon it, and then move it to a second tank. To a, a maturation and uh, or storage tank and go down to zero degrees Celsius and let it let it there for three or four or five weeks even um, longer than five weeks it's not good then you have dead yeast and that yeast is not not good in the taste but in the meantime you will you will balance out the beer I think and the yeast will settle down naturally you will have a better haze or less haze. And that's that's the key in lager beers, especially for us when we when we send it around the world, when we send it to the United States. And I was there and I tried it there. And I um, the first time I was really nervous to try it. I thought, how big is the difference from uh, beer over there than uh, here in Van Stefan? And there was no big difference. And I was really happy about that. And I think this is one of the keys. And yeah, why is it called lager? Because you have to lager this beer a long time. That's good for the beer. Oh, wh why is the name, Scott? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think there's a lot of talk about this. You know, how long is long enough? Um, uh, you know, so much when we talk about uh, these types, types of things in beer, the answer very often can be first, it depends <laughs> and, and and that it really just speaks to how many variables there are uh, in the process so for example um, Doug I think you were telling me um, a few weeks ago uh, Charlie was talking about uh, the um, I don't know antiquated um, uh, position of long lagering in his mind um, and uh, you know you can get um, if you, you can focus on a lot of things with lagering, you really can. There, there are a lot of changes in the flavor profile of beer as it sits over time. And some of those things are really quite subtle. Um, and in the case to be a, something that, that came to my mind with regards to storage time, when you have a, a, a cylindro conical tank, um, the, as you're chilling the beer, and we should talk about that a little bit too, Doug, you know, at the end of, uh, fermentation. Um, how should you chill the beer? Quick or slow? You know, that kind of thing. But uh, at the end, when the beer is cold and the yeast is, is really settling out, you get, of course, a lot of yeast settling out immediately, even before 
you chill the tank. When, when fermentation is over, you get a lot of yeast out and you need to remove that yeast right away. Uh, and then as the beer is chilling and, uh, and then when it's cold, you will still have things settling. And some of that is yeast, which are resistant to flocculation, uh, but will uh, end up settling out. And you need to get rid of those too, because autolysis will happen. And when you allow that to happen, then you get more off flavors in the beer that you're trying so hard to avoid. Uh, so lagering for a very long time can really be done uh, and, and should be done in certain cases for flavor and, and maybe overall mouthfeel quality reasons. Uh, but you have to be sure to remove the yeast uh, as that yeast is settling out. Uh, otherwise, of course, uh, the yeast will autolyze uh, and then you have some, a different set of problems. That's absolutely right. And it's also even harder to crop yeast or remove yeast from a, from a vertical tank. Uh, it's easier from a vertical tank than from a horizontal. So in our case, we have the, the main fermentation in a, in a vertical tank. Um, we wait until the acetate is down and um, extract is one or two percent above the final extract. Then we taste it. Then we crop the yeast the second time we crop it few days ago uh, before then we we crop a second time and remove the the, the, the rest yeast and then we um, we think uh, or I think uh, with as last yeast as possible you have a lot of in in, in the on the way on the on the high tank but everything is in the cone you remove and then we go to the storage tank which is a horizontal tank then we use the, the benefits of this um, low liquid high to have a faster sedimentation of the of the things which is inside mainly yeast um, and but also the yeast is still working and we go down to zero degrees celsius and the yeast is working slower of course but it's still working and it's getting out things and getting out polyphenols and everything else so it makes it more balanced and, and round and uh, lower lower haze. Well, thank you, Tobias. <clears throat> I think we're, we're going to have to kind of rapid fire from here. We have 27 minutes and 41 questions. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and Ingrid says, super informative session. Thank you, guys. Uh, Gary says, another great cast. Thank you, Doug. So, Let's run through these and to be as what I'll suggest, especially since Scott's not here, <laughs> hopefully he'll jump back on screen in a minute. Let's take about a minute per question and just kind of rapid fire it. And as soon as Scott appears, I'll read him the question and we'll just kind of take turns going back and forth if that's okay with you. Yeah. So our next question is from Ricardo. What are the benefits of lagering for weeks versus warming at the end of fermentation for VDK reduction, then cold grashing to about minus degree, one degree C and filtering and packaging? So again, the benefits of lagering for weeks versus a warming at the end. Yeah, <clears throat> as I said, so the key point is to have the diacetyl down. So what is warming? Warming is more than 10 degrees um, Celsius, maybe, I don't know. So I think we also have a, a good reduction of diacetyl within 10 days with our 10 degrees. Then we are done with diacetyl and then we can have, um, then it's, this is done, it's okay. And then the next point is bringing down the haze and uh, also the key point for us is the stability of the haze and the stability of the taste, especially for an export brewery. That's why we don't want to warm it up at the end because the warmer the yeast is in the fermentation and uh, the higher you will have your peak of diacetyl and the longer time you need to reduce the diacetyl. That's why I'm not a big fan of that. Scott, we're into rapid fire at this point. So oh. you've got the next question. We're going to take okay. about a minute for each one and, and you and Tobias will switch off. Okay. So our next question comes from Garrison. 
uh, contradictory information in brewing literature around yeast harvest, storage, and repitching practices. Some recommend rapid chilling to slow the yeast metabolism as fast as possible to preserve storage carbohydrates versus an external chiller, while others recommend progressive cooling to prevent stress protein formation and a vitality drop across the generations. What yeast harvest storage philosophy do you practice and what process technology do you use in your brewery to accomplish these goals? Mm, More than okay. one minute, probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. So, um, the uh, s- some of the answers to these kinds of questions are um, strain dependent. So it depends a little bit on what strain you're working with. So speaking about um, W thirty four seventy. Uh, we're using that in our lagers, um, same as you, Tobias, and I think that's probably the most widely used lager strain uh, in the world, I would guess. Mm-hmm. But at any rate, um, so uh, what you find is that um, th- this is, is something that, that I always uh, um, stress uh, with, with brewers is that um, this yeast will flocculate very readily uh, at the end of fermentation even before you chill it. At that point, you get your harvest out right away. Um, And after that, what you're doing with the beer, I think, uh, is maybe a little bit style dependent, um, but I I recommend a slow cooling uh, rather than a crash cooling because um, this gives uh, the yeast a little bit more time to to work on... um, uh, acid aldehyde and uh, any remaining diacetyl which might be there because when you when you're cooling slowly what happens is uh, in a cylinder conical tank for example you have cooling jackets around the tank on the sides and you turn those on and then they turn off and every time they turn on you're creating a, a little bit of a convection and a mixing so any yeast which is still in there is moving around and it's going to have a, a little bit easier time maybe maybe the the better answer is a little bit more opportunity to reduce uh off flavors that were produced during primary fermentation this is key to the maturation process but once you get the harvest yeast out of that tank what you need to do if you have uh bunged your tank or if you use spunding uh the 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 yeast has to be depressurized so you take it into a tank where you can store it, you can cool it down, you can mix it and depressurize it because you want to get the CO2 out uh, because uh, this is also a stress point for the yeast. Uh, so you keep the yeast cold. We usually use uh, for yeast storage uh, about 38F, which is 3.3 uh, degrees for storage temperature. And then we uh, take the pressure away, and then um, you should use that again if you're going to use it again. Different criteria at work there. But if you're going to use it again, you should use it within a day or two, not more. Otherwise, the yeast uh, starts to become unhappy. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. Ricardo has, how do you get improved attenuation after decoction? Uh, This is what one of the things Eric Toft mentioned. Please confirm that you need to get beta amylase temperatures after decoction. And this is for you, Tobias. Yeah, this is absolutely right. You need to have the beta amylases. So what we're doing, um, just quickly, we have um, in our um, original where we have the decoction, we have double decoction. And we uh, start with uh, 62 Celsius. Then we move uh, to the second vessel or the, the mesh ton, um, 72 for saccharification. Then heat it up, cook it, then bring it back to the main uh, point with 68, which is the beta amylases rest. And then we have, hold it a long time. A long time means 30 minutes. Then we split it again. First mesh is still on 68, second is going up to 72, again, saccharification, again up to 95, cooking, then back to 75, saccharification of everything, and then 
bring it to the to the lottering. And this is what we have the most time is 68 of the whole mesh, because beta amylases have um, a big influence of uh, on the final attenuation. But uh, the point is, beta amylases work with 68 and alpha amylases, which uh, cuts out the, the, the small starches, um, work on 72. That's a, another benefit on the decoction, because normally you should have the work of the alpha amylases before the beta amylases but they work on a higher temperature than the beta amylases work. So that's when we, when you split it, heat it up to 72, cut out the inner sides, and then go back to the 68, cut out the outer sides, then you have more sugar, and you will, you will end up in a higher uh, attenuation, final attenuation. That's, that's a big benefit in the decoction system because you use it on the right way alpha before beta and that not better before alpha like in the infusion system all right um uh, i guess tobias <clears throat> if you can help me with the next question we're going to move on to that since we lost scott <clears throat> how long can i leave a logger on yeast sediment without starting to worry asking is sometimes it takes three weeks for fermentation to complete three days for a diacetyl rest if needed And maybe even another week and a half for ramp down. Yeah, that's a good question. It's more or less some things we said before. So uh, remove the most of the yeast before starting um, the, the maturation. So if you have two vessels like we have, um, then you are perfect. If you don't have, use a cylindrical conical tank, then you can remove the yeast every day which is on the bottom of the tank because this is mainly dead yeast. So remove it every day. And then you just have the good yeast, which is which is in the liquid and is working. Um, we, as I said, have a lagering of three or four weeks, or sometimes five weeks in off season, but not longer. Because it's, if it's too long, the yeast will die and then you have the all the, the bad things of the coming out of the dead cells and you have a bad taste. All right. Our next question, <clears throat> Scott, if, if you're game, that, that one will go to you. Okay. Um, we'll get back to it here. This one comes from Ricardo. Is there an optimal mash pH for decoction to minimize tannins and get maximal attenuation? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, I guess the, the mesh pH, uh, should be as low as possible without, uh, damaging your enzyme capability. Um, I've played around with this a little bit. I find that when you get below, oh, let me see. I, I, I did a mash once. Uh, I got, uh, the, the main mash to, uh, four point eight five pH and I could not get uh, starch conversion <laughs> at that uh, pH uh, that's no surprise to anybody but at, at 4.95 uh, I, I could and that's kind of an extreme example but um, the point is that um, a typical mash uh, pH target of oh I don't know 5.2 or something, which is maybe on the low end of the scale. 5.4 is generally considered optimal. But um, the lower the pH, uh, the less tannic mm -hmm. extraction you will have. Uh, you also have a little bit less uh, efficiency in isomerization with your hopping. If you have a really low wort pH, a little bit less. But um, it seems like the, uh, uh, the, the point is just uh, to you know, maybe work on the low end of the scale, but you have to be careful there because too low is way too low and you'll end up uh, not being able to convert your mash. All right. We're right at 15 minutes left and we have 37 questions. So again, let's keep it to rapid fire. Tobias, you're next. Uh, Ricardo asked a topic. For ideal fermentation temperatures, including lagering for Hellas, brewed, for example, 3470. So 
he realizes I think this is a bigger question, but but if we can give a short answer for the fermentation profile for lagering a Hellas with 3470. Is that a short answer? Yeah, thank you, Ricardo. So a lot of questions and a lot of votes for his questions. So he's very interested in that. <laughs> um, I think we also handled that and, and we talked about that. So we had we have 10 degrees Celsius um, for main fermentation. And after the acetyl is down, we go to a storage tank, remove the yeast and go down to zero degrees Celsius for storage. All right, now, Scott, now that's a quick answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, we typically will. Uh, and, you know, I will say that when we're pitching from a fresh prop propagation, we, we treat the temperatures a little bit differently than if we're pitching from a yeast, which we have harvested. Um, and there's some other reasons for that. But normally we will go into the fermenter at uh, 48, which is 8.9 C. And then we, uh, we let it free rise a little bit up to 52. Uh, that's 11 C. Uh, but, but that's it. Um, there's a couple of schools of thought there. You can do a, a, a second free rise for a more rapid diastole reduction, uh, or you can just leave it and just wait an extra day. Uh, and whichever you choose to do, I guess, is a personal preference. Yeah, with, but with higher temperature, you have a, a rapid um, um, reducing of the diastole, but you, you build up more, so you mm -hmm. won't gain time. So yeah, yeah, that that's right. And other things are happening too. Um, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So you just look normally. You just look on dice until, but um, you have alpha, uh, alpha. Um, what is it? Acid all the yeasters, the all the yeasters, yeah. which yeah. you don't measure typically, but you will taste it at the end. And that's when when you end up in the fruity beer, which you don't want to have in a lager typically. Yeah. Yeah. My my. Uh, uh, Personal preference is to uh, just wait. Uh, you know, um, a, a short gain now is uh, maybe you pay for it later. <laughs> All right, Jeff, as our next question, what factors contribute to sulfur dioxide formation in loggers? Any suggestions for ways to mitigate excessive SO2 aroma in spunded lager? Tobias, can you help us with that one? Oh, this is a longer, longer answer for SO2 because this is not so easy. That, that, that depends a lot on the yeast. And um, I'm not sure which yeast um, Augustini uses, but I think a different one than we because they have much more in the taste um, of this sulfic. This is also typical for Bavarian lagers, but um, we don't have it because we don't want it. It's not that it's bad, but we don't want it. So you can influence that uh, mainly with the with the yeast strain, I think. Yeah, that's very true. Um, there's other things you can do if, uh, well, first of all, here in the U.S., I don't know if that's the same everywhere, but there's a, a legal limit. Uh, 10 uh, ppm is the legal limit for SO2 in beer before you have to make a declaration. Same here. Yeah. On the one point, uh, the higher the amount, the better flavor stability you will have. Uh, so that's maybe interesting. But um, uh, the, uh, the, the main driver is yeast strain. Beyond that, you can influence it by aeration of your uh, wort. But um, the thing that tends to drive that is less aeration means more SO2, but it also means a worse fermentation health. Uh, so it's better to to choose your yeast to to reach the goal uh, if you're concerned about SO2 than to do different things in your brewery to influence it. All right. Next question comes from Ron. <clears throat> we have 10 minutes and 34 questions. So if you vote up your questions, so we'll get the most popular ones. As a small three-barrel nanobrewery, lagering for eight weeks, just might not be practical or even possible at times. Could you elaborate on potentially safe ways to get loggers from the kettle to the tap 
a bit quicker. And I think, Scott, this was yours. Okay. Uh, you know, um, we've had some really good results with uh, three weeks, uh, you know, say a 21-day cycle time. Um, if you have a very good, healthy fermentation, you can be finished with uh, sugar reduction in, I don't know, six or seven days. And if you're waiting for uh, VDK reduction, maybe now you have 10 days. Then you can start to cool the beer something like this. Then um, if you chill, uh, you know, over the course of say three more days uh, or even four more days, that still allows you a good week of cold storage time for clarity and colloidal stability uh, and getting the yeast out. So uh, you can use a, a three-week schedule. Um, it can be that uh, if you want to, uh, you know, really kind of do something special, uh, if you have time, you can give it more than, than, uh, a week cold storage. But if you do a week, uh, I think you can get by with that in some cases. All right. We're down to eight minutes. Uh, Tobias, this one's yours. If you'll take it, given that it really was put in place to protect bread supplies, and now has so many holes in it, such as allowing fining agents like PVPP, sugars, and other malted grains in some beers, but not in others, not applying to exported beers or even newer German craft breweries. So the real question is, do you think that Reinheiskevolt, the purity law, should be retired from the statute books and just be a marketing gimmick that it now is, and would would it not make life better for German brewers? Mm. Okay, this is the Reinhardt's uh, purity law um, discussion. Um, and to be honest and not to be arrogant, but if you know how to brew, you don't need anything else than, than the Reinhardt's keyboard. Because if you know how, you can do a lot of variety of beers within the Reinhardt's keyboard. And I think this is more... Um, Nowadays, it's more like a green label because the people know it's just four ingredients we use. And yeah, when you mention PVPP, okay, but what is it? It is a, a thing which collects the polyphenols and comes out 100%. It just collects the polyphenols and makes it um, more more stable or longer, longer um, haste stability or not haste stability in this case. So we don't add it or anything else. And as we talked before with the sour good, you have a different taste with a neutral, uh, natural sour good than with an, with an artificial one. And I don't think we are within limits in the Ryan's keyboard. If you know how you use your screws, you can screw in the, in the, in the brewing process. If you know the, the science behind and if you have the experience, you can produce a, a whole big range of good beers within the Ryan's keyboard. And I think this is uh, also one point we are proud of it. I like that answer. Touche. So Daniel has the next question. I think both of you are going to have to throw out a number, but it's a short answer. Uh, how much pressure in spending? Scott, you want to start? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, we, uh, have, we calculate that a little bit. So for example, Depending on the temperature of the beer, this is determining the saturation of the CO2. So if you have a CO2 target of whatever it is, let's say it's 2.5 volumes, whatever your tank temperature is uh, determines what pressure you should add. So, you know, and then you have to add in the hydrostatic pressure on top of that. Uh, and so, um, I don't know. Rule of thumb, uh, I guess, uh, for us at our brewery is we go to uh, between 15 and 17 uh, PSI at spending. Tobias, any different? It depends on what you want to end up in the CO2 content in the beer. And then it's physics. It's temperature and pressure. And you can calculate that easily. If you want to have, stay with the lagers, 5 gram CO2 per liter, and you have zero degrees, um, 0 0.5 bar. 
this is a typical one. So you have to calculate it individual by temperature or and, and pressure. This mm -hmm. are the two keys. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's it. Pretty simple. Just physics. All right. <laughs> we have four minutes left, so probably just one, maybe two questions. And Tobias, I know you're ready to call it a day, so thank you. Uh, Ray asked what possibly might be the last question. Is lagering only a cleanup process, or is there desirable flavors or aroma that are created during lagering? And Tobias, if you'd take that. Um, it's, it is more or less a cleanup process because it's not a creating, it's a reducing of uh, flavors we don't want to have. So we reduce dyes to before, but we reduce acetaldehyde and, and esters, uh, which are naturally produced. We have to look after that they are not so high, um, but they will be reduced still. But it's also mainly a natural... Um, cleaner process, get down the yeast, uh, bring down the pinol, uh, polyphenols with the yeast, settle down to have um, a better filtration, a longer filtration, uh, standing time. It's also a point we also have to look on the on the yeah, money, of course, even if we have a lot of things we, we um, take, uh, we take time, but we want to be as efficient as, as possible, of course. Um, and we have the benefit of a longer high stability or less high stability, even when it comes All right, back. we have three minutes left, so I think we can sneak in one question more. Scott, if you would take this one. I'll try. Ricardo asks, and it has to be short because I want to say a thank you. Okay. Is there a trick to adjust hop flavor additions based on boil cooldown duration? i.e. given a hop addition at 15 minutes before end of boil and a cool down of 30 minutes, if the cool down is 60 minutes or 10 minutes, do you need to move this hop addition? And if so, how much? Yeah, I, I understand the question. So you're talking about the duration of the pump in. So the time it takes to take your wort, hot wort from the whirlpool and cool it down and put it in the fermenter. So that time is variable. You should consider that uh, during that time, you will still have isomerization and a little bit of volatilization of hop uh, aroma compounds. So you have to take that time into account when you're calculating your overall IBUs uh, and adjust up front for that. Uh, in terms of aroma loss, well, that's going to happen, of course, during the pump, and it's not very vigorous. There's not a lot of evaporation happening, but, uh, you know, uh, boy, uh, you could do late whirlpool additions or even better, maybe not uh, always appropriate in, in lager brewing. Uh, you can dry hop. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about dry hopping. Well, I want you, I don't know if you're paying attention to the chat, but uh Daniel, Raphael, Periodically Sober, Craig, Bill, uh, Rodney, Todd. I mean, there's just a huge amount of thanks. <clears throat> I want to say thank you to you guys. Tobias, especially you, you jumped in late into our plan here, and you're staying up late. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were no. both worried about you having to endure two hours. So I, I just no. want to thank you personally. Thank you. This Thank you for awesome. being here because um, it's always nice to see Scott. So normally we, we when we cannot meet in person, we just talk uh, on face to face with, with you without a lot of other speakers. When we have it last time, it was Christmas. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. On, uh, yeah, there just one, before Christmas. Yeah, that was one reason why I jumped in and also Doug, I know you. Thank you so much. And when a lot of people are very interesting, um, it's no problem to stay up late because it's not late. So as a brewer, you just sleep less because you are happy to stand up and go to the brewery at the next day. <laughs> well, we're almost.